Hello and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about chromatography. In this video we'll take a look at the method for chromatography. You need to make sure that you can explain this for the required practical. We'll also explore how chromatography can go wrong. And then we'll focus in on how we analyse a chromatogram and particularly pay attention to how you calculate and explain RF values. Since the components of a mixture aren't chemically combined together, the substances in the mixture retain their properties and the mixture themselves have properties which is a combination of the properties of the components in the mixture. And so the chemical properties of each substance in the mixture are unchanged. And we can separate the substances out from a mixture, provided that the two substances or three substances in the mixture have different properties. And in chromatography, the property that we use to separate the different components of a mixture is their solubilities. If substances have different solubilities, we can use chromatography to separate them. Typically, we'll use chromatography to separate out the different coloured dyes in something like an ink. In this technique, what we do is we take a piece of chromatography paper or filter paper and we mark a pencil line on this paper and on this line we place our sample that we're going to separate. And this sample will be a mixture of different colours that was all together in the same place at first. And then we place our piece of paper into a beaker that contains a solvent. Typically, this solvent might be water. Once you've placed your chromatography paper into the solvent, the chromatography process can begin. The water rises up the paper, and when it reaches the pencil line, the ink that is on the paper will dissolve in the solvent and gradually rise up the paper as the water rises up the paper. What we will see happening is the different dyes that make up the ink will travel up the paper at different rates. And so eventually those inks will separate out and form spots. And these spots will travel up the paper and finish in different places. We will stop the chromatography when the solvent has got towards the top of the paper. It doesn't need to get right to the top, but towards the top, because that will allow the greatest separation for our spots. It's very important that the line where we place our spots has been drawn in pencil, because if it wasn't drawn in pencil and was drawn in pen, when that solvent reaches the ink, which it will do over time, the line will dissolve as well, and that will interfere with our experiment, and it will rise up the paper and blur in with our spots that we're hoping to produce. Because the solvent might not be water, it might be something like ethanol, which evaporates quite easily, we sometimes put a lid on our chromatography experiment because that will reduce the rate at which the solvent evaporates. It's really important to make sure that the level of the solvent touches the paper but doesn't go above our starting pencil line. If it does, the spot will dissolve in the solvent and the water will take up the colour of those dyes and so the, the solvent might become a purple colour in the case of this one here where I've got a purple dye. And so that means that the dye might not rise up the paper at all. All of the dye might go downwards into the solvent. The final type of error in chromatography is to do with how long you leave it running for. And so first of all, we need to leave the chromatography experiment running long enough for the solvent to have risen far enough up the paper to allow the spots to travel different distances. And so in a way, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get the spots to race up the paper. If we don't allow the experiment to run for long enough, they won't have had long enough to separate out. And so we might have one spot still on top of another because the solvent hasn't traveled very far. But then the opposite thing is also a problem. If you allow the solvent to travel all the way up to the top of the paper 
and still leave it running, then all those samples will eventually reach the top of the paper. And actually, they will merge back together again. So instead of separating them out, we will have separated them out, but then allowed them time to re-merge at the top of the paper. And so we won't be able to identify them at all. Once the solvent has risen towards the top of the paper, it doesn't need to be the very top, we take the paper out of the beaker and we mark on how far that solvent has got. This is referred to as the solvent front. And then we will draw around the spots in a pencil and mark on how far those spots have travelled as well. We will always make our measurements from the starting line, sometimes referred to as the baseline, that we drew in pencil, and we measure from that line to the solvent front, or from that line to the spot. And we always measure our spots from the middle of the spot because they're unlikely to be perfectly circular. This completed picture that we get from the pattern of the spots on our paper is called a chromatogram. And we can use a chromatogram in a variety of different ways. First of all, we can determine whether or not a sample is pure, because if it is pure, we will only get one spot on our paper. We can also look to see how many components there are in a mixture. And the number of spots that we see having separated out tells us the number of inks that there were in the original sample. If we see three spots on our chromatogram, there were three inks in the original sample. If there are only two spots, then there were only two inks in the original sample. Another way that we can use our chromatogram is by comparing the substances contained in the different samples. For instance, we can see that for our substance X and substance Y, they didn't have the same number of substances, but their red coloured dye appeared to travel the same distance up the paper, and that suggests that they are the same dye. And in the same way, the light blue coloured dye in X travelled the same distance as the light blue dye in Y. And that suggests that they are the same dye as well. And substance Z, whilst it had a red coloured dye, it must have been a different red dye to the dye in X and Y, because otherwise it would have travelled the same distance. And there isn't a red spot in this position. The red spot for Z did not travel to such a height that they did for X and Y, which suggests it's a different dye. And we can also compare our samples that we've tested to a set of reference values. Perhaps we could have some reference values for a range of different coloured red dyes, and we could identify that the red dye present in Z is this one, because this known sample of red coloured dye travelled the same height that Z did and the red colour in X and Y travelled the same height as this colour, and so that means it is this red dye. And there wasn't any red coloured dye that travelled any higher than that, so those other known dyes that were red weren't present in either of our three samples. The final way that we can use our chromatogram is by making statements about the solubility of the different substances. The further a dye has travelled, the more soluble it is in the solvent that we used. And so this dark coloured dye, this blue dye that's present in X, appears to be the most soluble of all of the substances tested, because it travelled the furthest up the paper. And that's a characteristic of a more soluble dye. And then the red colour in Z travelled the least distance up the paper, and that means it is the least soluble of all the dyes that were tested. In chromatography, as well as comparing the heights that different dyes have reached, we can also calculate the RF value for a particular dye. The RF value, which stands for the relative front, is a numerical indicator that represents the ratio of the distance travelled by a substance, which is the solute that is dissolving, compared to the distance travelled by the solvent front on the chromatogram. We calculate the RF value using this equation that you need to remember. RF is equal to the distance moved by a substance divided by the distance moved by a solvent. 
And so we need to take some measurements, and we always start our measurements from the pencil start line. And so the distance moved by the solvent is measured from the start line up to the solvent front. And let's say we measured that as nine centimetres. And then we take our sample and we find the centre of that sample and then we measure down from the centre of the sample down to the start line again. And perhaps this was 2.7 centimetres. And then having done this, we simply plug our values into the RF equation. And so we have 2.7 centimetres divided by 9 centimetres. And this gives us an RF value of 0.3. And the RF value can be used to identify unknown substances, since different dyes will usually have different RF values with the same solvents. And so we could do a chromatography experiment with some unknown substance, calculate its RF value from the chromatogram, compare this value to a value online for this particular solvent, and then get a positive identity for this unknown substance. It's possible that you might be given a chromatogram showing somebody's results and you might be given one of the measurements for the chromatogram and you might be told the RF value for a particular substance and from that they expect you to be able to calculate an unknown value. And when you do this, I recommend that you write down the RF expression. RF is the substance distance divided by the solvent distance and substitute in what we know. And so if the RF value was 0 0.4 and the sample has traveled 5.4 centimeters, and we could be asked to calculate what the distance traveled by the solvent is. So we substitute those numbers, 0 0.4 equals 5.4 divided by the solvent distance. And so therefore multiplying both sides by the solvent distance gives us 0.4 of the solvent distance is equal to 5.4. Then dividing both sides of the equation by 0.4 gives us that the solvent distance is equal to 5.4 divided by 0.4. And when we calculate that, we get a distance of 13.5 centimetres. Or you could be given a chromatogram where they tell us what the distance travelled by the solvent is, 12 centimetres, and the RF value is 0 0.6, and they want you to calculate what the distance travelled by the sample is. And so again, we start by putting in the RF equation in full, then we substitute in the RF value of 0 0.6 and the distance travelled by the solvent of 12. To get the distance travelled by the sample, we have to multiply both sides of the equation by 12. That will then cancel out on the right-hand side, and so we'll have 0 0.6 multiplied by the 12 is equal to the distance travelled by the sample, which gives us a distance of 7.2 centimetres. Since the RF value is the ratio of the distance travelled by the substance compared to the distance travelled by the solvent, we can use any units at all. Most typically we'll use centimetres or millimetres, but the RF value itself will not have any units. But the number for the RF value has got huge significance. It can be useful to think of the RF value as a decimalised percentage of the percentage of the way up the solvent that the sample has travelled. And so a value of 0 0.5 means that the substance has travelled 50% of the way compared to the solvent. An RF value of 0 0.25 means that the substance has travelled only 25% of the distance that the solvent has travelled. And you can do the same thing for any decimalization of a percentage. Now the RF value itself can be any number at all between 0 and 1. An RF value of 0 means that the substance has not moved at all, whereas an RF value of 1 means that this substance has moved exactly the same distance that the solvent has travelled, and so will be at the very top of the paper. Two substances may have the same solubility in one particular solvent, and so will have the same RF value, but they could have different solubilities in a different solvent, and so therefore have different RF values.
When you look at a chromatogram, you can tell just by looking at the position of the spots which sample has a higher RF value than the other. And so, for instance, we can tell, because this is the solvent front, that the blue dye will have a larger RF value than the red dye because it's travelled further up the paper. And this leads us to the question, why do some substances travel further up the paper than others? Well, it's to do with them being more soluble, but why are some substances more soluble than others? And why does a more soluble substance travel further up the paper? To explain this, we need to introduce two new terms. And the first is the mobile phase. And this is the term used to refer to the solvent, whether that's water or ethanol. We refer to this as the mobile phase. And this moves through the chromatography paper and carries all the components of the mixture with it as it moves up the paper. And then the other term is the stationary phase. And this is the paper in paper chromatography. And this is the component that stays in one place and interacts with the ink as the ink moves with the solvent up the paper. But the stationary phase itself doesn't move, hence its name. The reason that the dyes travel up the paper when the solvent moves is that they are attracted to this solvent, or we might say that they have an affinity for the solvent. And so something that has a high affinity for the solvent will travel a long way up the paper, and that would be the case for the blue in this example. We might say it has travelled this far because it has a higher affinity for the mobile phase than the red dye does. And we could flip that and we could say that the red dye has not travelled very far because it has got a higher affinity for the stationary phase than the blue dye does. And that's why these two dyes have separated out. Their separation depends on the distribution of the substances between the phases. If something has a high affinity for the mobile phase, it will spend a long time distributed in that mobile phase, and so it will travel higher up the paper. Whereas something with a higher affinity or attraction for the stationary phase will not move so far because it will spend more time distributed in the stationary phase. We can do an investigation into the strength of the attraction or the affinity between a dye and the mobile phase, the solvent. And to do this, we'll have to do two chromatography experiments using the same stationary phase each time, the same paper. And since we're trying to find out a dye's affinity for the solvent, we'll have to make sure that we use the same dye each time as well. And this is what I'm showing in the two diagrams at the bottom of the page. I have a piece of chromatography paper in some water, so the solvent is the water, and in the one on the right, the solvent or the mobile phase is the ethanol. And let's say we ran this experiment for the same amount of time, the solvent has moved up the paper, here are the solvent fronts, and this is where the dyes got to. And we can see that the dyes have travelled up the paper different heights with those different solvents. But why? Well, the conclusion that we can make is that the one on the right hand side shows that the dye is more attracted to the ethanol than it is to the water. And so with the ethanol, the dye has spent more time in the mobile phase, or in other words, it is spending more time dissolved in the ethanol than it is in the water. And therefore, the dye travels further up the paper with the ethanol solvent than it does with the water, and so therefore the RF value is larger in ethanol than in water. We can explore the affinity between the dye and the stationary phase by doing two experiments using the same solvent each time and the same dye each time, but two different types of paper. And I'm showing here that we've got a yellow piece of paper that I'm just calling paper A and blue paper that I'm calling paper B. We would leave our experiment for a little while while the solvent rises up the paper and the ink is carried by it. And then after a while we'd take it out and we would mark on the solvent front and we would see how far the dye has reached. 
You can see from these diagrams that the die has travelled further in paper B than it has paper A. And this is because the die is more attracted to the stationary phase with paper A than it is in paper B. And so that must mean that the die is spending more time distributed in paper A than it is in paper B. In other words, the die is spending more time in the stationary phase with paper A. And we can tell this because the die does not travel as far with paper A than it does with paper B. And so the RF value with paper A is much smaller than it is for paper B.